Hi everybody, my name is Remy Joseph Salisbury. I'm going to give a short lecture on the issue of police in schools, particularly focusing on the issue of race and racism. So I'll talk a little bit about the political context with regard to school-based police officers. I'll then say a little bit about racism in policing and a little bit about racism in schooling. Once I've offered that background, I'll then move on to highlight some of the key issues with regards to police in schools. These have been highlighted by recent research and activism. I'll draw particularly on some quotes from a report that I co-authored last year with Laura Connolly and Roxy Lagan called Decriminalise the Classroom. Um, and this will be on the resource list of the that accompanies this lecture. For this, we surveyed 500 people in Greater Manchester about their views to introduce more school-based police officers. So as you'll be able to see from the slide, um, there've been more and more headlines over the last few years pertaining to this issue of police in schools. It's not just about headlines either. There's been several high profile calls for more police in schools. So the Youth Violence Committee in 2018 said there should be a police officer attached to every primary and secondary school in the country. In 2019, the Home Affairs Committee said that by the beginning of April 2020, all schools in areas with an above average risk of serious use violence should have a dedicated school-based police officer. In 2019, the Office for, Chil for the Children's Commissioner made similar pronouncements. In 2020, Cressida Dick, the head of the Metropolitan Police, said that neighbourhood police officers should be attached to every school. In 2020, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority said that they have plans to make police officers a permanent presence in schools. And just, just in 2021, Sadiq Khan has said that he's considering putting more police in schools post-COVID. And Andy Burnham, as the mayor of Greater Manchester, has reiterated his commitment to placing more police in schools. Much of the political energy behind these calls for more police in schools is coming from an apparent concern with serious youth, youth violence. And I think these calls should be understood in a wider context where the government have, have committed to increasing the numbers of police officers generally, to giving police increased powers uh, with regard to stop and search, and the government are also investing in the creation of more prison places through the building of more prisons. In, in addition to this, the police have been given unprecedented powers through the Coronavirus Act. So what we can see from this is that the police are being seen as a or perhaps the key solution to a lot of the social problems we're facing. Now, before I go on, I should note that Despite this recent attention, this renewed attention, relationships between police and schools actually have a very long history, dating back at least to the 1950s. However, the direct placement of police in schools dates back to 2002. So this is a long-standing issue that's had a resurgence recently. And there's a risk that police in schools is becoming an increasingly normalized phenomenon without it being thoroughly questioned or justified. So I now want to look briefly at um, policing and racism. Just to get an indication of the issue of uh, racism as it pertains to policing, we can look at stop and search as a starting point. The latest available data shows that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped by the police than white people. But it's not just about stop and search. We also see disparities in a wide range of areas, including in relation to arrests, use of force, use of taser, and racial profiling through gangs databases, uh, through the prevent duty and more. But we also see um, evidence of police racism through the insights of community groups, activist communities, and through qualitative research that for several decades and perhaps much longer,
black communities and communities of color have described and made clear the deep-rooted racisms that that shape policing. And I think key to understanding racism as it impacts upon policing is the concept of institutional racism. And this means that the problem of racism is not only about individual people or individual officers, but it's about institutions. Racism is something that is embedded in organizations and institutions like the police. This is to say that racism is deeply rooted in the culture, the norms, the policies and the practices and the organizational structure of the police. This is why year after year, and despite changes in personnel, the police force continues to produce racist outcomes. And before moving on, I just want to share this quote from an academic based in New York, Alex Vitale. He says that the reality is that the police exist primarily as a system for managing and even producing inequality by suppressing social movements and tightly managing the behaviours of poor and non-white people, those on the losing end of economic and political arrangements. Now, this definition really bristles against popular understandings of the role of the police. However, for Vitale and other critical academics, this is born out of the long-standing evidence regarding racism and classism in policing. Such a critical understanding of the role of the police, I think, urges us to think more carefully about the prospect of police in schools and presents a challenge to those who see police as a solution to social problems. Now, if we look at schooling and racism as well, these are perhaps best illustrated by school exclusion data, which shows that, for example, Black Caribbean and Gypsy and Roma traveler students are significantly more likely to be excluded. Similar inequalities can be seen in terms of GCSE attainment. And behind those statistics, research for a long time has highlighted issues with a Eurocentric or white centric curriculum. Uh, disproportionately white teaching force or put another way the underrepresentation of black people and people of color in the teaching force a lack of diverse resources uh, a lack of racial literacy amongst teachers put another way um, the teaching profession is ill-equipped to teach diverse groups of students to teach um, from an anti-racist perspective and then there were also some contemporary issues like discrimination through school uniform policies there have been several stories in the last few years of black students being excluded or disciplined in schools because of their natural hair whether that's afro hair dreadlocks um, or any other cane rolls uh, and other um, typically black hairstyles and David Gilborn, the academic who works on racism and schooling, has said that schooling actively reproduces white supremacy. The question is then, given that race, the racism that underpins schooling and the racism that underpins policing, what are the consequences when these institutions are brought together th through the introduction of police in schools? So now, I want to focus on five issues um, pertaining specifically to policing schools. The first of these is the danger that policing schools exacerbate existing inequalities in society. The evidence we have suggests that this is the case, and this mirrors patterns in the US and Canada where policing schools have been embedded for a long time and have actually um, impacted most harshly on black and Latino communities um, and working class communities. So there's a number of ways that this, this will take place in this will and already does take place in the UK. Firstly, we know that school-based police officers are more likely to be placed in schools with a high proportion of working class students and more students of colour. Secondly, within schools, 
evidence from young people suggests that officers act in ways that discriminate against students of colour and particularly black students. In addition to the concerns about black and Asian students, there are also concerns about the negative impact that school-based police officers will have on disabled students, LGBTQ plus students, Gypsy Roma traveller communities and women and girls. And there's a quote here on the slide from a young person who, who says, there was a police officer that was part of the staff at the high school I attended, disliked by most students due to the more prominent attention they gave to students of colour. And this was quite a common um, report that we received um, amongst the responses to our survey. The second issue that I want to highlight pertains to the stigmatisation of schools and the stigmatisation of communities. Or the idea that schools with school-based police officers will be viewed more negatively or stigmatized by the surrounding communities. And as you can see there on the slide, 70% of the young people who we surveyed said that they felt school-based police officers would see a stigma attached to um, those schools. 72% of parents and guardians said that they would be hesitant in sending children to a school with a school-based police officer for those reasons. And this point is illustrated by the quotes on the side. The first is a young person who says, society will likely view the role of the police as a sign the school is a problem school. This is problematic as I feel it's more likely the police will be instigated in schools in deprived areas. And the second from a community member who says, it suggests that these communities are a danger to school and civic life. It will deepen harmful stereotypes about people from these communities. So this quote really shows us how the stigma attached to certain schools threatens to also impact upon certain communities and it therefore reinforces negative stereotypes of race and class. The third issue that I want to highlight is that of low expectations. Now low expectations have been a key issue in education for a long time. Low teacher and societal expectations have been offered as an explanation for the low attainment levels of particular groups. Now, as well as impacting upon what groups or sets students are placed into, which exams students are entered into, and disciplinary procedures in schools, there's also the issue of self-fulfilling prophecies. This is a, is a popular um, and long-standing, lo often used sociological concept that in the concept of schooling basically suggests that if, a pu if pupils become aware that society or their teachers have negative expectations of them, they may internalize these expectations and then they will play out in a way that impacts upon student behavior and student grades. Now there's some more recent research that shows that some students, particularly black students, have used low teacher expectations as a source of motivation and actually um, seen those teacher expectations as something to that they need to prove wrong. And that's allowed them to, to um, reach higher attainment levels. However, this issue of um, low expectations is still one that needs to be taken seriously when we think about race and racism in schools. Now, in terms of policing schools, the danger is that the very act of placing police in a school and having an officer around that school signals that the expectation within the school is not one of high attainment and achievement, but one of low attainment and criminality. The fourth issue I want to highlight is the danger of policing schools creating a climate of hostility. Now, a lot of the justification for putting more police officers in schools is that it helps to create a safe environment. It helps to ensure young people feel safer in schools. But the evidence that's been gathered, gathered in recent years, some of the more critical evidence at least, shows that the presence of police is actually making school environments feel less safe and less welcoming for young people, particularly young people from over-policed communities, working class communities and communities of colour. And you can see some examples of uh, quotes that illustrate this there on the slide. And the academic Jasna Jar has said that what should be the sole aim of schooling, 
providing education, support and safety and promoting critical thinking, curiosity and confidence is being subsumed by policing strategies of surveillance, profiling and social control. So policing schools are creating a climate of hostility and fear that is antithetical or is a barrier to learning. The fifth um, issue that I want to highlight relates to the criminalization of young people. Here, the issues that would otherwise have been a minor school issue, perhaps leading to a detention or a talking to, now risk becoming a criminal issue when a police officer um, comes to deal with those issues. This is illustrated by the quote on the slide from a parent or guardian who said, I feel matters that should be dealt with by teaching and pastoral staff are escalated unnecessarily to the school police officer. This almost criminalizes normal school behavior. And a key issue here is the school to prison pipeline. And this concept describes the way in which schools can and do prepare students for and push students into prisons or into criminalization. Now, there are a range of ways that this occurs through school exclusions, through low expectations, but the presence of policing schools really solidifies this pipeline. It creates a connection straight from schools into the criminal justice system and from that criminal justice system into um, the prison population. Now, an important thing to remember is that the pipeline operates along racialized and class logic. We've already seen that officers are more likely to be in school in some schools than others, schools in working class areas, and more likely to target some students than others, black students, for example. The consequence of this is that the pipeline is likely to affect those students more than others. And this has been a big problem in the United States where the schools of prison pipeline directly feeds black and Latino students in particular into prisons. Now, this is a real concern in the UK, given that there are already racial disparities, class disparities in the prison population, and that more prison places are currently being created. Okay, so having highlighted those five issues, and there are plenty more that, you, that you'll be able to look into on the resource list, I wanted to think a little bit about alternatives to policing schools. Now, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, in the summer of 2020 sp highlighted the possibility of defunding the police. By this, I, I take this to mean shifting the resources and power away from the police to other um, more supportive, more nurturing aspects of society. And a lot of the people that we spoke to said that they would much rather have an additional teacher, an additional counsellor, youth worker, um, in schools than a police officer. So as we look to consider how we can defund the police, and this is already happening in the United States, I would argue that a key starting point would be the removal of police from schools and the investment in um, the wider infrastructure of schools, investment in teachers and counsellors but and youth workers, but also the investment in um, community centres, youth centres and the community infrastructure that has been um, decimated in recent years. So I hope that that was interesting and you can follow up on some of the resources.